Okay, welcome to Psych 101 General Psychology. Today we're talking about uh, development and um, we're covering the second half of this chapter. Remember the first half we talked about a little bit about prenatal development. We talked about Piaget's theory. We talked about Kohlberg's theory of moral development. And we talked about uh, Mary Ainsworth and the strange situation and, we, and the different uh, attachment styles, okay? Today we're getting into a different theory uh, and then we'll start another one after this, okay? So first we're gonna talk about Diana Baumrin's uh, parenting styles. Diana Baumrin, I believe was uh, Mary Ainsworth's uh, student. She was a or graduate student of Mary Ainsworth and uh, <clears throat> she took Mary Ainsworth's research further. And she also did observations uh, you know, of children and their parents. And, uh, and she noticed that uh, they fall into certain categories as far as parenting. Okay. And she noted that there's different parenting styles. Okay. And here they are. So the first parenting style that she noticed uh, was she labeled as the authoritative parenting style. I'll tell you right off the bat, this is supposed to be the appropriate, the good kind of parenting. Okay. This is what is uh, encouraged here in the US in Europe and Canada, basically the white Western world, right? Uh, this is what's supposed to be the uh, good kind of parenting. Other cultures, if you're Asian, for instance, Latino, um, other parts of the world, uh, they may believe in a different kind of parenting style, but this is supposed to be the best one according to our perspective here as Americans, okay? Or the Western world, okay? So the authorita authoritative parenting style, right? Uh, there is discipline, okay? So authoritative parents uh, have rules for their, their children, right? You're not allowed to do this, this, or this, right? This is when you go to bed, and this is when we do this, right? There are rules. And the rules are also explained. This is why you need to go to bed at this time. It's because we have school tomorrow and it's early. This is why you're not allowed to play on the street. You're gonna get hit by a car, right? They explain the rules. They also enforce the rules. If the rules are broken, there is punishment, okay? <clears throat> But the punishment is not severe, by the way. The punishment is kind of uh, medium, okay? It's in the middle, okay? Um, and importantly, the rules are adjusted with age. Little kids, by the way, need very strict rules. No, you can't play on the street. No, you can't cross the, you know, the street by yourself. Yes, you have to go, go to bed by 9 p.m., things like that, okay? No, you can't use the pool by yourself because you're gonna drown. Okay, we need to watch at all times, right? No, you can't use the pool right now. Mommy's busy, I can't watch you, so you can't use the pool, right? Uh, <clears throat> there are strict rules for little kids. As they get older, the rules can be a little bit different, okay? For instance, teenagers need different rules. For teenagers, uh, yes, you can go out with your friends as long as you call me and tell me where you are and you check in with me, right? And you get make sure that you get home at a certain time. Or as long as you take your little brother with you, so that he can tell me if you're doing anything you shouldn't be doing, right? Uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, you can use the pool, right? And you're old enough, you know how to swim. You can swim even better than me now. So yeah, you can use the pool by yourself. You know, um, older kids need different rules, okay? Because what happens is that as children get older, you slowly loosen the reins and you slowly let them go. And you let, and you let them take on more responsibility, have more of a say in their lives. So that by the time they're grown up, they're ready to take care of themselves, okay? ready to take on the world. So yes, there is discipline, there are rules, they are explained, they're enforced, and they're also adjusted with age, okay? There's also lots of love with authoritative parents, parents uh, right? Authoritative parents show their children lots of love. They love their, their children, right? They tell them they love them, they hug them, they kiss them, right? So they're warm and responsive, they're encouraging. They tell them things like, oh, you can do anything you want as long as you put your mind to it, as long as you work hard enough, right? Or if you know they're in little league and they lost the game, a good parent will say, "It's okay that that you know that that you lost. You know you'll get them next time. You know, <clears throat> or you just have to work harder. You'll you know you'll get them next time. You know you're still a winner in my book. That kind of stuff, right? You know, th those kind of parents. <clears throat> um, if you raise your children this way, according to Diana Baumrin, they're more likely to become self-reliant." Right? They learn how to take care of themselves. You slowly loosen the reins. You explain the rules and they understand why they have to do certain things. You encourage them to work hard right? and you know, make something of themselves, so to speak. Uh, they're cooperative. They learn to follow the rules. Uh, they tend to be high achieving adults because you love them. You encourage them. right? 
and they're more likely to believe in themselves. That's the authoritative parenting style, which is what is encouraged, by the way, with, that's what's considered acceptable here in the US and uh, you know, Europe, Canada, Australia, that kind of stuff. You would usually consider the white Western world, but in the US we're very diverse, but that's what is encouraged here. And, and I will talk about in a moment that uh, yes, there, there are different parenting styles other than this one, and that they do, uh, some are preferred more by some cultures than others. So yes, white people do prefer this parenting style more. This is considered the best parenting style, okay? But if you're black, if you're Latino, if you're Asian, there's probably another parenting style that you might prefer. And um, <clears throat> I'm not saying that those parenting styles are better. Based on the research, this is supposed to be the best parenting style, but the parenting styles do differ by culture as well and nationality and country and that kind of stuff, okay? Because there, is, there are other parenting styles that are not considered as appropriate, not as good. There's also the authoritarian parenting style, which by the way, if you're Asian, Latino, Black, you're more likely to use this with your kids, although it's not considered to be as good, okay? And I'll point out why. With the authoritarian parenting style, yes, there is discipline, all right? But it is very strict discipline, okay? There are very strict rules and they are enforced, okay? If you break the rules, you will get punished, not only punished, but severely punished. These are the kind of parents who are likely to beat their kids. They don't, I'm not saying that all black people beat their kids or all Latinos or all Asians, okay? But um, they do favor this parenting style a bit more than white people do. You know, it's because of the, it's, this is the old, old school, so to speak, the old way of doing things. Even white people and Americans used to be like more authoritarian. Talk about, talk to your grandparents back in the day, how they were raised and they'll probably tell you, yeah, it was this kind of parenting style, it was authoritarian. Yeah, it was very strict. My parents were very mean. They'd beat the crap out of me if I was ever out of line, right? Latinos, black people, Asian people tend to be a little bit more mean, a little bit more harsh with their kids. They're more authoritarian, okay? <clears throat> they believe in strict discipline, okay? Uh, problem is the rules are not explained, okay? It's like, why can I go out and play with my friends? Right? Or why can't I go to the party? The explanation that's given is because I said so. And when you live under my roof, you follow my rules. It's my way or the highway. Right? You're not allowed to question my authority, that kind of stuff. Right? I'm the parent, you're the child. Um, not all parents who are authoritarian, by the way, beat their kids. Some of them do. By the way, beating your kids nowadays is considered child abuse. You're not allowed to beat your kids anymore, to slap them, punch them, kick them, whip them with that belt or hit them with that chancla, that is inappropriate child abuse, okay? You're still allowed to spank them, um, but it has to be open palm, over their clothes, not under their clothes. You're not allowed to leave bruises, okay? If you do leave bruises, you do are beating up your kids, bruising them, you can get into trouble, have your kids taken away and you, know, have, and you could end up in jail for that. Um, and they don't adjust the rules with age either. Say, I don't care that you're a teenager and you think you should be hanging out with your friends or going out. It's like, no, you're not allowed to go out. You follow my rules. You do as I say, right? They don't adjust the rules with age. And that is a problem, okay? Because they're always very strict. Children who are younger need stricter rules than children who are older, okay? But there's lots of discipline, okay? These are these authoritarian parents, right? Um, there's not much love, by the way. So love, it says none or basically not much. Um, there, they might be a little bit, but not much, okay? They're emotionally distant. They're more like the cop who is gonna enforce the rules and they're just waiting for you to mess up so they can beat you or punish you. They look at you like they don't even like you, that they know you're gonna screw up your life and that somehow they're gonna have to pay for it. And they don't wanna do that. So they're very strict, they're very mean, they don't really tell you they love you, they don't really hug you and kiss you, they don't really tell you you're, you're gonna grow up and do wonderful things in your life. They're more basically uh, looking at you like, you piece of crap, you know you're gonna mess up and when you do, I'm gonna be there to bust your ass. That kind of stuff, right? Almost like the cop, right? Uh, they're very mean, okay? They don't really show you much love and that's really bad, by the way. You need to love and encourage your children. These parents don't do much of that, okay? <clears throat> the results, if you raise your kids this way, they're more likely to become law abiding. They learn to follow the rules, so they're more likely that they're gonna follow the laws too, right? But they're gonna be distrustful. No one really, their parents didn't really trust them. Trust is a two way street. If you want you know, your children to trust you, you kind of have to trust them, 
to some extent. And they didn't trust you. So you don't really trust them so much. You don't really trust other people so much. They were mean to you. They were harsh to you. They didn't really show you much love. So you're kind of distrustful of others. Not a good relationship, right, to have with your parents. And you're less likely, you're more likely to have bad relationships with others down the road. You're not really going to trust people very much. More likely to be dependent. Why? Because they tell you what to do. They tell you how to think. They don't let you grow up. Okay? So it's like you still need them to continue telling you what to do. And I'll tell you something else about this uh, parenting style. Okay? If you are this way with your kids, they're going to give you more of a hard time when they're teenagers. Because when they're teenagers, they're less likely to take this kind of stuff from you. When they're kids, yeah, you're strict or mean to them. They're going to be afraid of you. When they're teenagers, then maybe they still are, be, they still will. But some teenagers, when you treat them this way, they're going to say, screw you, right? I'm out of here. You know, see you later, right? And some of them are likely to run away, you know, before they're even ready to take care of themselves. And that is bad, okay? They're not ready to take care of themselves. And it's bad if they run away. They're more likely to end up as delinquents, gang members, end up in prostitution, homeless, that kind of stuff, right? You don't want to be so strict, so mean that you drive your kids out of the house, so to speak. Now, some of them are so mean, they kick the damn kids out of the house themselves, you know, but that's the authoritarian parenting style. Not considered the best parenting style, but at least they, be, they are, you know, they can be law abiding because they learn to follow the rules. But if they do run away from home, then they're going to have problems, okay? <clears throat> There's also another kind of parenting style considered the, uh, that's called the permissive indulgent parenting style. This one's also not considered as good. Um, and the problem with this one is that there's no discipline. Discipline, well, none, right? Very few rules, if anything, no punishment. These are the parents who let their kids do whatever that they want. You don't feel like going to school, honey? That's okay, you can stay home. You want to date? Oh, okay, that's okay. Just make sure you, you know, you protect yourself, right? You know, you want to take a trip with your friends, so you're going to be gone for a three for three days. You know, that's okay. Just you know, make sure you call me, right? Um, it's like kids can do whatever they want. <clears throat> they don't want to do their work. That's fine, right? Um, if you can afford to, these, you know, these are the kind of parents that uh, give them everything, spoil their kids that give them a bunch of stuff get, and, you know, and are nice to them when the kid doesn't even deserve it. They haven't done anything to earn it. So they don't really believe in punishment and discipline. These are the parents, by the way, who often want to be their kid's friends. They, want, they treat their kid as if it's a friend. You are not a friend, okay? You are a parent. You're supposed to have discipline, okay? They are love, they, they, they do show their children lots of love. They are, they are warm and loving, <clears throat> their children. They do hug them and kiss and tell them they love them, you know, but the problem is there's no discipline. If you raise your kids this way, according to Anna Bomberin, they're likely to become socially irresponsible. They didn't learn to follow the rules. They didn't learn that they can't get their way all the time. So they'll tend to be immature and throw tantrums, even as adults. <clears throat> they're not responsible. They're spoiled brats. And I'm sure you guys have seen on TV, in the news, how certain people act like spoiled brats and, and get into trouble. And we usually hear about celebrities, by the way, because, you know, the rest of us, you know, middle class, lower class, whatever, you know, when we do something bad, it doesn't end up in the news because, you know, we're not that important. But a celebrity acting up or doing this or that or throwing a fit over here, they might end up on the news or on social media, right? Uh, acting socially irresponsible, acting like immature brats, basically. They're spoiled, you know, is basically what it is. That's what happens when you uh, are a permissive, indulgent parent. You basically end up raising a spoiled brat. And you cannot function like a spoiled brat when you're an adult. Because when you're an adult, if you don't follow the rules, you're going to get in trouble. When you're an adult, right, if you don't compromise to people, if you don't treat people right, you're going to get your butt kicked, okay? That's what happens to you, okay? So um, not the best kind of parenting, but at least they do love their children. There's a kind of parenting that's even worse, that's the worst one of all, okay? And that's the permissive, indifferent parent, the uninvolved parents. These are the ones that physically, mentally, one way or another, they are not there. <clears throat> it could be that they're locked up in jail, you know, or it could be that they're drunks, drug addicts, and they're just not there mentally, psychologically. Or maybe they are there and they just don't give a damn, you know? It could also be maybe that they're working too damn hard, right? They're working two, three jobs, and they're never home. 
and you basically, you know, you, you know, you go to school on your own, you come back, you let yourself into the house, you, you fend for yourself, so to speak. That's the permissive and different parent. Okay. Uh, they're not around one way or another to take care of their kids. This is the worst one. So there's no discipline. They're not there. Okay. There's no love because they're not there either. There's emotionally indifferent. Maybe they don't give a damn about you or they're just not there and can't really show you any love. Okay. So you end up kind of raising yourself to some extent. And what happens when children raise themselves? Usually bad things. Kids don't know how to raise themselves. Not even teenagers don't know what the hell they're doing. Teenagers can be very emotional and moody and, uh, and just uh, irresponsible. So what happens if kids are raised this way or basically there's no one there to parent them is that they, well, they tend to become dependent. They don't know how to do things. They don't know how things work. So they kind of need other people to help them out. They tend to be impulsive. They didn't learn to follow the rules. Undisciplined, they'll do whatever the hell they want when they want because that's the way it's been. No one was there to tell them no, that you can't do this. This is not right. You're gonna get into trouble. No one was there. So they're impulsive, undisciplined adults. Irresponsible with bills, with employment. You know, they didn't learn how to become adults. There's a reason why you have parents. They're supposed to teach you things and guide you, right? And prepare you for the, you know, adult world that comes later. But if they're not there, you actually get into some really messed up stuff. You're more likely to be abused, you know, uh, because no one's taking care of you. You're more likely to get into trouble. Um, and you don't know what you're doing. Children don't, don't know how to raise themselves. You might think as a teenager, when you were a teenager, that you knew everything and that you maybe you would have been able to raise yourself. But chances are that no, you don't. Okay. A lot of gangsters, delinquents, people who get into a lot of trouble come from this kind of parenting. No one was there for them. And that's the truth, you know, it, for a lot of them. Some of them, by the way, do become delinquents and gang members and stuff like that, despite their parents trying their best and, and, and being there for them. But there are others who really are criminals or bad people or whatever it is because no one was looking out for them, so to speak. And, th and that does happen, you know, but I will tell you that there's also many children who come from this or, or people who come from this kind of parenting and they turned out okay. It doesn't happen for everybody. Sometimes you just grow up faster and you learn how to take care of yourself and you have to do what you have to do, right? They don't all become dependent, impulsive, and undisciplined, but a lot of them do, okay? You don't want kids raising themselves, so to speak. That's the worst kind of parenting. And those are the four kind of parenting styles that Diana Baumrin noticed, okay? Um, sort of kind of building on Mary Ainsworth uh, attachment styles. We have another theory to talk about. And it's Erickson's um, stages of uh, social development. Erickson's theory is interesting because it's a lifespan theory. It basically starts from birth and goes all the way to death. There are eight stages. And the thing is that at each stage, there is a challenge. There's kind of a crisis. There's something that must be resolved. And if you resolve it the right way, then there's a virtue to be gained, okay? And I'm, I'm giving you here the simple version of Erickson's um, theory, so it's easy to understand, okay? But the first stage of Erickson's theory is called basic trust versus mistrust, okay? Birth to about two years of age. You know, that first stage of life, Erickson said, okay, so what does the child need to determine during that first stage of life? The child needs to determine, right, if the world is trusting and loving or is it scary and hurtful, okay? Birth to about two years of age. Uh, I mean, you're born helpless, dependent. Those first couple of years, you're at the mercy of your parents, you know, especially during the first couple of years. And this is, this is, this is the time um, when you learn how to trust, according to Erickson. That's why it's called basic trust versus mistrust. If you have positive experiences, your parents do a good job of taking care of you, of raising you during this time, then you develop a strong attachment to your parents. In other words, you have a secure attachment, you love them, you trust them, they love you, and they take care of you. You're more likely to have good relationships with other people, teachers and uh, friends, right? More likely to have positive future relationships, romantic relationships. Guess what? This first stage of Erickson's theory, right? According to Erickson, it will affect your future relationships. If you did not, ha did not have a good relationship with your parents early on, chances are you're not gonna have a good relationship later on with your significant other. 
because what happens when things go bad, if you have negative experiences, you have a bad relationship with your parents, right? They didn't take care of you that well. They neglected you, maybe abandoned you, maybe mistreated you, abused you, right? Um, you don't trust them. And you don't trust other people. And you're more likely to have bad future relationships. When you do get into relationships, guess what? You're not going to be too trusting. So you're going to think that they're cheating on you, that they don't love you. You're going to have this fear, right? That they don't care about you. They're going to abandon you because you don't trust people. That's what this stage is about. It's about trust. And if things go well, you develop trust. And if things don't go well, then you develop a sense of mistrust, right? And that's what happens to the people for whom this stage doesn't go very well. You know, maybe you have bad parents. Maybe your parents gave you up. You know, maybe you're raised in foster care. There's many different things that can happen. Maybe your parents died and weren't there, you know? Um, but luckily for most people, it goes okay, but there's plenty of people for whom this stage didn't go very well and they have issues with trust. And according to Erickson, you carry those down the road with you. It's a very interesting theory, Erickson's theory. It really says a lot. That first stage is very important, of course. Second stage is called autonomy versus shame and doubt. Um, age is about two to three, maybe two to four, depending on which book you read. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. So now the question you must answer as a child, right, is can I do things by myself or not? Okay, what happens is children are, you know, they start to talk, right? They learn how to walk, they learn how to use the potty. Um, they start developing abilities. Okay, and you, and if you want, you might want to underline uh, using the potty. Potty training is important. This is, it's going to be similar to Freud's theory, which we'll talk about later when we talk about personality, but potty training is especially important. If things go well, let's say that potty training goes really well. If you have positive experiences, you develop autonomy. In other words, parents properly potty training, train you, let's say, right? They show you how to use the potty. Uh, they don't make you feel bad, right? Um, <clears throat> And you learn basically that you can do things on your own, right? They encourage you, right, to walk and talk and just, uh, you know, to develop these abilities. So you have positive experience with your parents, with your parents, and they, uh, you develop autonomy. Autonomy means that you can do things on your own. And according to Erickson, you're going to carry this with you down the road. You're still going to have this sense of autonomy. When you're older, you're going to feel like, yeah, I can do things on my own. I can do these things, right? It's very important to believe that. If you have negative experiences, instead of developing autonomy, you develop shame and doubt. So maybe your parents were too mean, too harsh, right? Especially during potty training. Let's say that, uh, you know, they weren't patient and they yelled at you, punished you, right? And they called you a big baby. What the hell's wrong with you? Why can't you use the potty, right? So-and-so's kid is your age. They're even younger than you. And they don't know how to use the potty. And, you're, and here you are, you know, acting like a baby, right? They're really mean and harsh with you. So instead, you develop shame and doubt, okay? And you're going to carry the shame and doubt with you down the road, according to Erickson. So when you're older, you're still going to be shameful and feel doubtful about yourself, doubtful whether you can do certain things, okay? Um, that's what happens, right? If issues are not resolved early on, they affect you down the road. Let's keep going. Third stage is called initiative versus guilt, okay? Three to six years of age. Now the question the child must answer is, am I good or bad, okay? What happens here is that children are getting a little bit older, and around this time is when children really start getting into trouble. They start doing things their parents don't like. And by this, time, by this age, by about four actually, usually, maybe three, is when parents expect you to behave yourself a little bit more, right? You're not a newborn anymore, okay? You should be able to behave yourself. And behavior conflicts with parental rules. Maybe you're throwing things and breaking things inside the house, right? Maybe you're screaming and your parents want you to be quiet, right? No running with scissors, that kind of stuff. No pulling your sister's hair, right? So children become concerned with what they should do. What should I do? If you have positive experiences during this time, you develop initiative, right? The parent, your parents basically, uh, you know, let you be a kid. It's okay to run and play when you're outside and scream and do all that stuff. It's okay to get dirty, right? Um, inside the house, no, I don't want you running around. I don't want you screaming. Inside the house, there are different rules and you do things differently, right? If parents give you the right guidance, the right boundaries, you know, you develop initiative. You feel like, yeah, you can do things. 
on your own, so to speak, or you can decide what to do, what you should do, right? Uh, with, you know, with guidance, you develop initiative, which means you're a self-starter. You don't have to be told what to do. When you get older, this is gonna be important that you have initiative, right? Because here you are in college, do you have initiative? If you have initiative, no one needs to tell you that you need to study, that you need to work hard, that you need to do things a certain way, right? If you have that initiative. But if things didn't go well for you early on, from ages three to six, right, during this stage, you had negative experiences. Let's say your parents always told you, no, no, bad boy, bad girl, don't touch that, cochino, marrano, whatever it is, you know? Uh, no, you know, and they always want you to behave yourself. They don't let you be a kid. They don't even want you running around and screaming out there, right? picking up that stick or that rock, don't touch that. You're gonna get dirty, right? Uh, they're too mean and too strict. And what happens is that children don't develop initiative according to Erickson. Instead, they go around feeling guilty. And they have to ask as children, is it okay if I play now, mommy? Can I do this? Can I do that? And they feel like they always have to ask and they go around feeling guilty. When you're older, you're gonna, you're gonna have this guilt with you still, according to Erickson. So let's say you're in college. You know you need to study, you know you need to work hard, but you don't, you don't have initiative. And instead you just feel guilty. I should be doing this, should be doing that, ah, but I just, I just don't want to, I'm just, I just can't do it, right? You need somebody to tell you, you know, so to speak, somebody to make you, to force you, right? Instead of doing what you should do, you should you just go around ex experiencing guilt, right? That's a problem. So that's the third stage, initiative versus guilt. Stage four, industry versus inferiority, seven to 11 years of age, okay? These are very important school years, by the way. By this time, you're in school and it's, it's, it's your first several years in school. I think you start, I think first grade or about six. You could have started school before this, but these especially are very important school years. So the question now you must answer is, am I successful or am I worthless? Relationships widen from family to peers. You're spending a lot of time in school by this time. And you have your friends, you have your peers. And what happens is you compete with them. You compare yourself. And you want to know about where you stand. You know, are you smart? Are you good looking? Are you popular? Are you athletic? Kids care about a lot of different things. And this is the time when they really compare themselves. If things go well for them, if they have positive experiences, they develop a sense of competency. They feel they can do things well, that they can get things done. And that is also called industry, a sense of in industriousness, right? I can produce things, right? I can do things well, I can do things right, right? Academics matter as well. How good are you at writing and reading and math and all that stuff, right? Academics matter. I can tell you that matters, right? Uh, athletics matter, looks matter. You also compare yourself on looks with other kids, right? On athleticism, on popularity, and, uh, and behavior, how well behaved are you? Are you one of those problem childs, right? Or are you, uh, are you well behaved? All those things matter and children kind of know where they stand. And if things go well, if they compare well, they develop a sense of competency. They feel good about themselves. They have positive self-esteem. They feel they can do things well. They compare well. There are other kids who have negative experiences and will instead develop a sense of inferiority. Maybe they're not as good academically. Or maybe they feel that they are not as attractive, not as athletic, or not as popular, or whatever it is. And because of that, they feel they don't compare well, and they feel inferior. And they have low self-esteem. And according to Erickson, you're going to carry this with you down the road as a teenager, an adult. You will still feel inferior. You will ha still have low self-esteem. But if you develop competency, positive self-esteem, Sense of, a sense of industriousness, then you will feel good about yourself later on. You're more likely to feel good about yourself because you believe in yourself. You know you can do things well. That's industry versus inferiority. And then we enter the next stage, which is very interesting. The next stage spans the period of basically adolescence to the early teens, right? The central thing during adolescence, according to Erickson, is identity. Identity versus role confusion. Identity versus role confusion, okay? So you're an adolescent, start puberty, right? You're an adolescent, let's say. Let's say you're around 12, 13, 14, 15, right around there, that's when this uh, stage is happening, right? Early adolescence, early teens, identity versus role confusion. So now the main thing is, the question you must answer is, 
Who am I? Who will I be? Who am I? Right? What should I be doing with myself? All those things. Um, you may experiment with certain roles, different lifestyles. Yes, teenagers have a, a tendency to experiment, right? Especially with their hair. They want to wear their hair a certain way. They might paint their, you know, or dye their hair pink or green or, or something else. Or maybe they, they're, they're gonna, they, they want to, you know, be like the skater type and dress a certain way with those vans and those, you know, those jeans with the holes in them or whatever it is. Uh, experiment with certain lifestyles, you know, maybe they try that they, they feel that they're athletic and they're going to try being a jock or maybe they find out oh, I'm one of the smart kids. I'm, I'm you know, going to be the nerdy type or whatever it is, you know, the popular type. Kids find that they fit into certain roles, certain lifestyles, certain cliques, you know, maybe in junior high and in high school. That's when that starts. Um, but the question is, who am I? Who will I be? You know, and they're trying to figure out who they are, you know. Am I a dork, a nerd, you know? Am I uh, an, a an athlete? Am I the popular type? Am I just the cool type, you know? Um, there are also, by the way, uh, unhealthy, unhealthy roles in lifestyle. So there's those that experiment with drugs and delinquency and gangs. And there are some that get involved sexually too early, okay? And that is unhealthy. Um, but it's about identity. You're trying to figure out who you are and what you're going to do with yourself. And that is why during this time, that is why you're so self-centered and you care so much about how you look and you care so much about what you wear and your hair. And I know some of you are still like that, but it started during this time because it's about identity. You're trying to figure out who you are. So you focus a lot on how you look and how you come across to other people. If you have positive experiences during this time, you develop a stable, healthy identity. You figure out who you are, basically, even without verbalizing it, and you realize, hey, I'm one of the smart kids. You know, I'm just going to work hard. I'm going to take these AP classes, and I'm going to go on to college, right? Or maybe you figure out, you know what? I, I'm, uh, I'm the military type. I'm going to go into the military. Or maybe you figure out that, you know, hey, you know, I'm one of the cool kids, and I'm just going to hang out and have fun and party or whatever it is. And that's what they do, right? Uh, but there are others that have negative experiences who develop an unstable identity and are confused about who they are. They experiment with certain roles, right, lifestyles, and they don't seem to fit in, right? And uh, because of that, maybe they'll try other things. They'll try unhealthy things. So maybe they don't fit into the different groups. So maybe they'll start using drugs. And they, hey, let's see what this does, right? Or maybe they'll start hanging out with the gangsters, the delinquents, the druggies, right? And uh, that's unhealthy. Or maybe they're just confused about who they are. Don't know who the heck they are. And they're just all, you know, angry and, uh, and anxious. And they're messed up psychologically. And I can tell you that a lot of children are messed up, uh, messed up, so to speak, and don't know who they really are because they come from broken homes. If you don't know who the heck you belong to, who your parents are, it's harder to figure out who you are. When mom and dad are both home, guess what? That affects your identity a lot. A lot of who you are has to do with who they are. And here's the truth. Most of you, you're going to grow up and be just like your parents. Their identity is kind of be similar to yours. You can be different, but most of you, you're going to be just like your parents. You're going to look like them. You're going to age like them. You're going to have similar habits, similar ways of thinking. That's the way it is for most people. But guess what? If dad left because it didn't work out with your mom, then guess what? You as a boy during this time are going to have more likely to have trouble, right? Who are you, right? What does it mean to be a man, right? It really does uh, have an effect on people's identity. Or maybe if you were adopted, you don't even know who your real parents are. and You know you were adopted, right? You can be very confused about who you are. I've known people who are extremely confused. People who raised in foster care, didn't have any idea who the heck their parents were. I've never met them. And they're, they have more issues with identity. And I remember one person, she didn't even know what her ethnicity was. She didn't know if she was black or white or Latino or Asian or anything. She looked like she could have been any of those. Because by the way, there's a lot of variation among ethnicities or so-called race. Race isn't real, ethnicity is. There's a lot of variation. And there are people who are kind of somewhere in the middle and they could really be considered anything. And um, when you don't know where you come from, it's hard to know who you are. That's the reality. And I'll tell you more about identity. Identity is influenced a lot by why you, what you see on TV and on the internet. 
during the 70s, this is what people wanted to look like. This was what was considered cool. So a lot of people wanted to look like this with the long, shiny hair, you know, the tight, shiny pants, you know. Um, that's what was cool back then during the 70s. Talk to some of your parents, maybe your grandparents, maybe your grandparents, right? You guys are younger, maybe your grandparents. And they'll tell you, yeah, I wore the bell bottoms when I was young. Yeah, I had the sh shaggy hair and, you know, and maybe the beard and stuff like that. Uh, the people who are musicians, cool, popular on TV, that's kind of the people who we want to be like. We tend to copy our identities, right? We tend to copy, first we try to copy who's cool on, on there. And then we realize that we're just like our parents and we're going to be just like our parents. That's what ends up happening. But we try to be cool. And this is what was cool, this is what was cool during the 70s. And then came the 80s, and the 80s were all about the big hair, right? The big hair, you know, that's what it was, you know? Rock was popular, right? Um, and this is what people wanted to look like. By the way, this is my own biased perception, but I do remember, yeah, I remember Michael Jackson. He had the long hair too back then, right? So did Prince, you know, uh, and all these rockers over here, right? Um, I was a kid during this time, right? And I remember that, yeah, I wanted to look like these dudes, knew these people. I grew my hair long as a teenager. I had hair down on my shoulders. I wanted to be one of these rocker dudes, right? That's what was cool. And then I learned, yeah, I eventually learned and figured out, you know what? I'm not one of these rocker dudes, right? I'm not one of these dudes, right? I'm just, uh, uh, you know, a smart kid. And, uh, you know, I mellowed out and, you know, cut my hair and, and then became like everybody else, <laughs> went to college. And that's what happens. Uh, then came the 90s. The 90s, I see it more of a period of transition, right? Uh, you know, rock was kind of on its way out in the 90s, the hard rock, right, the heavy metal, and it was more now about hip hip hop and rap, right, and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, and, 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 but grunge was still in, I see grunge and Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that stuff as kind of like, like the end of kind of like the rock era, you know, and after that, things totally changed, but it's kind of a transitional period. I remember it, things are getting overly sexual, now you have to be cool and tough or whatever it is. It's always kind of been that way, but that's what I saw during the 90s. And then the 2000s, right? And it, it's became hypersexual. Now, if you're a woman, you have to be sexy and show lots of skin. And, uh, and if you're a guy, you're, you know, you're tough and kind of cold and you, know, you don't give a shit about anybody. You know? And that's what kind of was cool in, in the 2000s. And I'm older now, by the way. Now we're in the 2020s. We just started 2020. To tell you the truth, I don't know what's cool anymore, right? I'm, uh, I'm out of touch. I'm older. I'm setting my ways. I still listen to my music from the 80s and 90s. Right? There's some stuff, modern music that I listen to, but most of the stuff I like, it's that hard rock. It's that classic rock. It's all considered classic rock now, right? It's that stuff from, uh, you know, a lot of stuff from the 90s, right? Uh, it's mostly rock. You know, I was one of those rocker dudes. At least I wanted to be, right? But the point is we tend to copy our identity, but it really helps when you have a mom and dad who kind of, you know, help you shape that identity. You know, but eventually you end up becoming like your parents. Even though we want to be cool, you'll find out most of you not cool, okay? And you're going to be just like everybody else. That's the reality. Some of you might, you know, be, you know, someone that becomes like one of these people who becomes famous or popular. Most of you will not. That's the reality. But I know, I remember in high school and stuff, in junior high, um, the most people I grew up with, some of them did become famous. I know of a couple of people. Not extremely famous, right? Um, but famous enough, you know, they're rich and they're wealthy and, uh, one of them's on TV, you know, another one's a Senator. Uh, one of them actually was what, a representative in California, not as, as, you know, there's, there's senators at the kind of federal level. And then, uh, you know, well, the senators from California, have always been the same ones. He wasn't one of those, but representative, a representative of California, he's in politics now. And yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a very influential guy but there's another girl who actually is on TV. I won't show you, I won't tell who she is, but she's on TV, a lot of people know her. It's more in the Spanish TV, okay? Not English, but she's, and, and for the Spanish audience, uh, she's, uh, she's well-known, I went to school with her. Oh, and don't forget, uh, actually, uh, Oscar de la Hoya, I'm sure you guys have heard about that, the famous boxer, right? Gold medal winner, right? Uh, actually, he's been like several years, been like 20 years, I think probably since he's fought. He was the best boxer for a while. Guess what? He went to my high school. Right. He was like a couple of years or uh, I don't know how many years, maybe two, three years ahead of me. Uh, maybe a couple of years. But he was. Uh, yeah, he went to my high school. So there are some of you, perhaps you might in the future or, you know, might make it big. And but most of you will not. And that's the reality. Most of you are just going to be just like everybody else. You're going to be like your parents. 
hopefully more successful, but you know, life is tough. Um, stage six, intimacy, intimacy versus isolation, okay? You're a little bit older now, now it's, your, now it's young adulthood, late teens, early 20s, right? Uh, in your late teens, early 20s, you are different than when you're in your early teens. Early teens, you're, you're kind of very shallow, very concerned about your appearance. You still are during this time, but now it's a little bit different. Now, now it's, you're a little bit more mature and, and you, um, you're a little bit different. You can still be quite irresponsible and shallow, by the way, during this time. A lot of people are. But according to what Erickson believed, according to Erickson, um, this stage is called intimacy versus isolation. And it's that for a reason. This is the time, according to Erickson, when the main question is, will I find someone? In other words, you want to find someone to settle down with during your late teens, early 20s. You want someone to love you and someone that you're going to love. For most of you, things will go well and they'll be okay. And you'll adjust to living with, other, with someone else, develop a successful relationship. You find someone, you move in together, maybe you get married, you know, maybe you have kids, but uh, you find someone, okay? There are some who have negative experiences and feel lonely, feel like they're never gonna find someone. They're getting a little bit older, you know, uh, and parents start pressuring them. Hey, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna give me some grandkids, right? That happens later now, by the way. Uh, this stage is a bit outdated. Most people don't settle down now in their late teens, early 20s. In other parts of the country, like in the Midwest, they kind of still do. But most people now, no, it's more like their mid 20s, late 20s when they settle down and get married. But you're concerned about finding someone way before that. And this is a time when it's really important when you really want to be with someone. Okay, at least that it is right. But settling down, Maybe not until later. Hopefully you find someone and last relationship lasts for years, then you decide to get married. But hey, man, I didn't get married until, what, how old was I? Um, been married for about, uh, I think it was like 35 when I got married. I waited, went to college, went to graduate school, eventually found you know, the person who was gonna be my wife, but uh, you know, we waited. We were together for like five years before we got married. And that's what happens. You know, For some people it happens a little bit later than others. And more people are putting it off, okay? But, you know, yeah, you'll find some people, you'll date this person, that person, you know, and uh, get your heart broken several times. And eventually you'll find someone that you're gonna settle down with. And even then it might not work out. You might end up divorced. That's the reality, but that's this stage, intimacy versus isolation. And by the way, I wanna point out those things that happened to you earlier will affect you here. They, you know, things that happened to you early on will affect you at the later stages. Guess what? If you have a good sense of identity, if you know who you are, it's gonna be easier for you to find the right person. If you have a sense of competency, right? If you feel good about yourself, if you are trusting, all those things matter. Uh, later on, you enter the stage of generativity versus stagnation. Late 20s to retirement. This stage will span decades. It can span like 40 years. This is the stage where I am at. At this time, you're basically, uh, you found someone, you've settled down, you're working is really what's happening here. Okay, you established a career and you're working. And the question is, will I succeed as a parent and worker? Will I produce something of value to society? Okay. So what happens here is, you know, you've settled down, raising a family, you're, you're working, usually you have a job and you're trying to do something to help people, to help the next generation. You're trying to produce something of value. It's about generativity, right? Producing something of value versus stagnating, you stagnate and don't go anywhere if things don't work out well during this stage. Most people who have positive experiences, they'll raise children, right? Help their children, help their grandchildren. As they get older, right? Uh, they'll have a job where they feel they're being productive, right? And develop and have a sense that, yeah, they're generating something of value. Feel that they are being productive, okay? But there are those who will have negative experiences and fail to contribute. You know those people who just wanna smoke weed all the time or are drunks or don't give a damn about anything, you know, do whatever the hell they like, don't wanna to go to school or college or get a job or anything like that. You know those people, right? What happens is that you keep doing that and you just continue partying or hanging out or, or just doing drugs or drifting, whatever. Drifters are people who move from place to place, right? Um, people like that, they never settle down. They never make any choices about career and settle down basically to actually stay with somebody and raise those kids. Those are people who are failing to contribute. And uh, what, what happens is the years go by very quickly. 
and, ev and eventually you'll get to the next stage and these are the people who are gonna have major regrets. Those who didn't really go anywhere, who stagnated basically, who didn't produce, they kind of wasted their lives because you enter the last stage and the last stage is called ego integrity versus despair. And now the question is, have I lived a full life or have I failed? If you feel that you've lived a full life, right? You've got positive experiences, then you have a set, you're filled with a sense of integrity, a sense of wholeness, right? You're content with your life and your choices. Okay with your past, not too many regrets. Okay with the way things are going now and still looking forward to the future. You don't know how many years you have left. You have left. You might have decades left or maybe just a few. But this is when you're older and you're looking back and asking yourself, how did I do? Those for whom it went well, they've filled with a sense of ego integrity, a sense of integrity. But there are those who look back with a sense of despair. Those that have negative experiences will look back with a sense of despair and will ask themselves, where did the time go? What happened to my life? You know, how did it all work out so badly? How, how, did, how did all the time just go away? I mean, I, I just, what happened? They feel disappointed regrets about their past and their present and they fear the future they know they may not be a lot of time left and they feel that they're wasted their lives and these are those people these are those senior citizens by the way who are grumpy and upset get out of my way you damn hippie you know that those kind of people the ones who are mean they have a lot of regrets and disappointments they are angry and depressed and miserable but most of them are going to be happy and will not be mean they'll be more helpful and nice, right? Those are the ones that fill with positive experiences. But this is when you look back and you ask yourself how it went. And the thing is, life is gonna go by very quickly, okay? This is how quickly it's gonna seem, okay? All you have to do is close your eyes and then open them and you're old. That's how quickly it's gonna seem. You might not seem that way now, but the older you get, the faster things go, the faster things move. It just seems that way. It's not really moving faster, but it's going to go by really fast. And you're going to go, you're going to be looking back and asking yourself how things went. And the thing is, there's a study that was done in 2005 by Reese about Americans' biggest regrets. And when people look back on their lives and ask themselves how it went, or ask themselves about their biggest, or, or tell about their biggest regrets, uh, one out of every three has regrets about education. These are the people who basically look back and, and say, I wish I would have tried harder. I wish I would have gone to college. I wish I would have paid attention. I wish I would have listened to my teachers, right? Biggest regret, education, okay? Career is second. Career will affect your education. I mean, education will affect your career, right? Romance comes next, 15%, right? Then parenting, wish I would have been a little bit different. Self, right, taking care of yourself not too high there, leisure, even, even lower. But the biggest regret is education for most Americans. One of every three will look back and say, damn, I wish I would have gone to college. I wish I would have paid attention. I wish I would have tried hard. And that's the reality. And the sad thing is that the people who need to hear this are the ones who are not in school, the ones who are not going to get this message, the ones who are not in college, right? Every generation needs more and more education to be successful, OK? Uh, you know, a, a uh, high school diploma doesn't cut it anymore. You know, you need more and more education. Most people need to go to college now to really, you know, have a good career. It's getting harder, okay? And then the last thing is just references, things we've referred to, okay? So I will stop there. Let me stop recording.